What is up, YouTube? This is Red Leprechaun Gaming, and welcome back to He Who Fights with Monsters, Book 1, Chapter 14. Worlds Apart. Jason sat at the bottom stair of the chamber while Farah removed the collars from Rufus and Gary. His whole body was racked in pain after using the last of his mana to conjure the cloak and float down from the top of the chamber. Explain something to me, Jason said. If you can do that... He gestured at the sections of the wall melted by lava. Then how did they catch you in the first place? Ambush, Rufus said. We were meant to resupply and get information from a local contact. Instead, he set us up for capture. We're going to find him, Gary said. And, hand if, and have a sizzling conversation, Farah added. But first, Rufus said, we're going to have to get back to the vain estate. They still have Anissa, and I'm concerned about the cultists that Jason lured away. If they left because they saw the tides turning, they're probably headed back to the estate. You think they'll use Anisha as a hostage, J Gary said. Possibly, Rufus said. They might take her for leverage or worse. After the collars were removed, Rufus and Gary started stretching like they'd just woken up. Farah, in the meantime, held her hand out over the ground and chanted something quietly. It was a short chant, only a few words. When she was done, a large chest made of dark brown stone rose out of the ground. It didn't break through the floor, but instead rose up through it like a ghost. Farah pushed open the hinge, the hinged heavy lid, and took out fresh clothes for herself, Gary, and Rufus. They all started changing clothes with no qualms about stripping down to their underwear in front of Jason or each other. Jason glanced surreptitiously at the three of them. Rufus and Farah had the bodies of Olympic athletes with lean muscle, filled with the power of coiled springs. Gary was so huge that he made bodybuilders look like they were still under construction. His wild mane and leonine features completed his majestic appearance. Jason didn't know what passed for handsome in Gary's species, but he suspected Gary was it. Why am I the only one who doesn't look super good looking? What? Rufus asked, leaning over as he pulled on a shirt. Jason thought back to the beautiful, beautiful Cressida Vane, standing next to the ordinary-looking High Priest Daryl, and was struck by an unpleasant revelation. I'm the Daryl, he said, disconsolated. What are you talking about? Rufus said. It doesn't matter, Jason said, shoulders slumping gloomily. Clothes are fine, Farrah said, but we need to get our gear back. I just hope the ones who left didn't go back to the manor and swipe it all, Gary said. Watching the others change clothes reminded Jason that he had completed the quest to get a shirt. That was two cages and a shovel to the, to the head ago. He stood up and pulled the shirt from his inventory, discovering that it was a plain white t-shirt, complete with what looked like machine stitching. Holding it out in front of him, he read the printed label on the front. I went to a magical alternate universe, and all I got was vast cosmic power. Jason shook his head. This must be what insanity feels like. What does it say? Gary asked, moving up to examine the shirt. You can't read this. It's not in any language I know. Probably for the best, Jason said as he pulled on the shirt. You have equipped starting gear outfit. Outfit tab has been added to your inventory. Outfit tab? What? Gary asked. Nothing. Never mind, Jason responded. Jason checked the inventory, which now had a second screen that he could access with a tab at the top labeled Outfits. He was used to navigating the screens with a thought and opened the new section. It showed a silhouette with various slots for equipment, most of which were empty. There was also a column to the left empty side for two, from two entries. The first was listed as Starter Gear, and the second was New Outfit. How does that work, he muttered to himself. You can designate sets of gear as outfits, allowing you to equip and switch between them. Outfits can be modified by adding or removing items from item slots. The outfit can only be equipped so long as all the items in the outfit are in the inventory or already equipped. Huh. He noticed the others were watching him stare into the middle distance and mumble himself. You all right there, Jason? Gary asked. Sure, Jason said. Actually, now that you say it, he'd been pushing through a potent mix on a potent mix of panic and adrenaline, but now the immediate threat was gone and he was starting to crash. His wooziness came back, his vision going dark and blurry. 
He stumbled forward, dropping to his hands and knees, his empty stomach trying again to heave, but there wasn't anything there. The next thing Jason knew, something was being splashed over his face. Spluttering awake, he was helped into a sitting position, and a glass bottle was shoved into his hands. Drink it, Ferris said. It's just water. You can't take any potions for at least a couple of hours. As Jason slowly sipped at his water, he looked over at the icons he could see at the edge of his vision. The health silhouette showed a warning yellow all over, with a more ominous orange on his head in midsection. The potion cooldown icons were also the the potion cooldown icons were also present, but were completely grayed out. There was an icon for the mana toxin with more than two hours listed under it. While Jason was taking stock of his miserable condition, the others were recovering theirs with stamina potions from the magic chest. After drinking his, Rufus made a sour face. Oh, that was sickly. What happened to the potions? Gary chose the flavor, Ferris said. I think it's nice, Gar Gary said defensively. Me too, Ferris said. Rufus only likes things when they're bitter. After letting him rest a while, Gary pulled Jason easy to, easily to his feet. Jason wavered, and Gary held them upright with the di until the dizziness passed. Thanks, Jason said. I've passed out three, four times today. I think my brain might be bleeding. We can't use potions on you any time soon, Ferris said. But once we get back to Anissa, she can heal you. What are we waiting for, then, Jason said. They left the chamber through the huge stone doors. Jason glanced back behind one of them at the space where he had hidden. The tunnel was surprisingly long, carved directly out of the stone. Who made this tunnel, Jason asked. It must have been a tough job. Wouldn't be that hard, Ferris said. Construction magic would make it straightforwards. She looked up and down the extensive length of the tunnel. Might have taken a bit, though, she acknowledged. They emerged, they emerged from the gap at a distance. They emerged from a gap that at a distance would have looked like a natural crevice. They were on the gentle slope of the lower portion of a mountain that the tower... That tapered up to a towering height. The upper reaches were black and lifeless, while the lower portions turned to yellow stone and red earth, with patchy coverage of dry yellow grass. There was a wagon outside the tunnel. The wheels choked to stop it from rolling down the slope. It had a yoke for animals, but the harnesses had been cut and the animals were gone. Did they scatter the horses so we couldn't use the wagon? Jason asked. What are horses? Gary asked. You've never heard of horses, the other three shook their heads. Then what was pulling the wagon, Jason asked. Heidels, Gary said. What's a heidel? It's a work animal, the kind you see everywhere, Gary said. They pull wagons, carry packs, you can ride them. I can too, but the, you can tell they don't like it. Why are you playing with an envelope? Fred, what are you doing? Fred, Fred, Fred. Maybe the name is just different, Jason said. Four legs, hooves. Sounds right, Ferris said. Long body, Jason continued. Long head. Heads, Gary corrected. Heads, Jason said. Is there more than one? Yeah, two heads, scales, horns. That sounds horrifying, Jason said. We're definitely not talking about the same animal. The animal doesn't matter if there aren't any here, Rufus said. Which means we're walking. Jason looked down the slope, getting a panoramic view of the land below it. It was a flat, dry landscape of, sel of sandy yellow and somber reds, punctuated by withered grass or spiky shrubs. Every so often, a low tree with sparse foliage would jut reluctantly up from the barren earth. The sun hammered down relentlessly over all of it, but the arid air was almost pleasant after the cloying humidity of the sacrifice chamber. The climate bore no resemblance to the modern warmth to the moderate warmth and lush greenery he had experienced in the hedge maze. Even the heat felt different there, more pleasantly warm than this unforgiving desert air. He remembered looking up at the world map, a warped but not entirely different globe than the one at which he was familiar. It marked his position as being in the Kalahari Desert, which matched the terrain now before him. They started down the slope, Gary in the lead. He was wearing loose clothing to let air flow through, along with a hood to shield him from the sun. The others were wearing more fitted clothes, but didn't appear discomforted. 
They brought us here when I was unconscious, right? Jason asked. That's right, Rufus said. How long was I knocked out for? This is very different from the place we were in before. They all turned to look at him with curiosity. The Venus State uses climate magic, Ferris said. Didn't you notice when you were went there in the first place? Actually, how did you get involved in all this, Rufus said, now that we have time to talk? Um, I think I might have been summoned, Jason said. Not on purpose, obviously. Who'd summon me? I went to bed, which was last night as far as I know, and I woke up in the middle of the Vane family hedge maze. I sort of stumbled around for a bit until I found one of the residents, and from what I gather, he was trying to summon something and got me instead. He called me something that sounded specific. I don't remember what exactly. Otherworlder, maybe? Outworlder, Rufus suggested. Sounds right, Jason said. Is that what the name suggests? Is this really a whole different world? We've always been in this one, Rufus said. You'll have to tell us if it's different enough from where you came from. Jason thought about the flying eels and leech monsters, people throwing around magic chains and streams of lava, healing potions, reading languages he'd never seen before, the magic powers he's used for himself. All of it should be impossible. It's definitely different enough, Jason said. My world has its share of strangeness, but this is on a whole different kind of strange. Some things are weirdly the same, though, like hedge mazes or people named Gary. I have a cousin named Gary, not as tall as you, but almost as hairy. Is he a Leonid? Gary asked. I think it's a glandular thing. We don't have Leonids on my world. I'm not well versed in astral magic, Ferris said. I've heard of Outworlders, but it isn't my field of expertise. Alternate realities, maybe, Jason said. Some things are the same, others are different. If that's what this is, then this world diverged from mine a very long time ago. The continents are different, but not completely. The fundamental physical laws here have some interesting addendums. My world doesn't have magic at all, or a second moon. Did I see? I did see a second moon, right? Your world only has one moon, Gary said. That's weird. And that's the end of chapter 14. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, you guys have fun.